where capitalist profit, quote unquote, or interest comes from, and why the worker and landlord only pay. <clears throat> Now, so this, is, this, is just pure, this is even in the world of certainty. This is even in, in no change, no risk. The second thing, of course, the capitalist provides is uh, he pays the money now and takes the risk. Uh, in, in a real world of certainty, you have a situation where uh, you, know, you produce the SL car, nobody buys it, or whatever. So, so there's a tremendous risk. And the, the entrepreneur or businessman becomes the major uncertainty bearer. The worker and the landlord get the money now or relieved of this uncertainty. They get the payment right now. And the entrepreneur takes it upon himself to sh uh, shoulder the burden of this uncertainty or the risk. So what you have then is a <clears throat> return on capital, a business return, is divided at least conceptually into two parts. There's long run profit or normal natural profit or natural interest, which is you know, something like 8% or whatever it is. Uh, again, it's very difficult to spot it empirically. Okay? It's a natural interest of time preference. And as a profit for su successful forecasting, pure profit, it's called, plus losses or minus losses if the guy's a lousy entrepreneur. Okay. So this is the risk component, the uncertainty component, is the profit, pure profit and loss, which is sort of on top of, it's a vector on top of the natural rate of interest. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I think it's a useful analysis, even though know, we never get to find equilibrium. By talking about equilibrium where there's no, there's no change or no uncertainty, we can then separate out conceptually what the capitalist return will be on pure time preference and what it is on profit and risk and uncertainty. So that's the, the analysis, the illustrated analysis of where this uh, returns in capital come from. Um, Orthodox economics is more, sort of grudgingly accepted some of the time preference, but not very much. Certainly not this time market analysis. Um, <clears throat> um, wow, so the the, um, the fact that the cost curves are not the same is that you can't prove the tangency at all by I think it's uh, uh, enough to scuttle the uh, perfect competition people. Uh, and also the fact was there never is a situation, there were never any equilibrium. That's another interesting point. And so in the real world, there's always profits and losses and whatever, and there's no way you can compare tangencies, there ain't no tangencies. Even, well, even if there were smooth curves, it would be, it'd be somewhere like here. You know, and nothing could be true one way or the other. <clears throat> uh, one interesting thing, the ones around cost curves, uh, <clears throat> is that <clears throat> the, uh, I like to deal with total cost and total revenue anyway, because I think it's, it's more, it makes more sense as average stuff. But at any rate, the, uh, the cost curve is defined, you have a usual total cost curve, something when you start with zero, you produce nothing, it doesn't cost you anything, you know, like if you're not in business. So the usual cost curve is depicted as something like that. Um, it's a total cost. What happens, this, this assumes, of course, I mean, if you take any given production, you're producing 10,000 loaves of Wonder Bread, the possible costs are infinite. And if you want to keep raising your cost, you can do it. So what this is really is, is an envelope of the minimum total cost of what what was the absolute minimum that you could, you could produce the stuff for so you, because your prop your returns your profits are is equal to total revenue minus total cost you're interested in keeping the difference as high as possible <coughs> and uh, getting the total cost as low as possible uh, so what you have is sort of a whole bunch of possible costs and the market economy forces Businessmen, so to speak, to keep them as low as possible. However, yes, we looking at a firm which is not doesn't have these rigors of the free market. Take, for example, a firm which specializes in government contracts. There's a very different situation now occurs. The government contracts, at least in the United States, are so-called cost plus contracts. Uh, <clears throat> okay, fella, you want to you want to buy paper clips from you or dams or missiles or whatever it happens to be, we will pay you cost, whatever your cost is, plus Guaranteed profit of 8% or 10% or whatever. Now notice what this means. Cost plus means any cost, any cost which would be in any way justified. Well, if it comes to your interest end for your cost to start ballooning upward, if, you, if you're a business and you want your cost to balloon upward, it's very easy to do it. Very easy. Just let them float. And the government, the taxpayer, you know, pays up the difference, gives you a guaranteed margin of profit on top of that. What the hell? Why not? And so you have all sorts of things happening where, um, in war contract, defense contract firms, there's so-called hoarding of labor. Okay. Uh, 
if you need, if you're an engineering firm, if you're producing stuff from the US government, if you really need, if you're a private firm, let's say you hire 50 engineers, why not hire 150? What the hell? You may as well keep them 100 sitting around idly and then have a peak week where they all work like man and sick, drop back to playing poker the other 51 weeks a year. Because the cost that you pay for them can be just incorporating the, the bill that you give to the Pentagon or the, whatever other department of government. And they'll pay you the guaranteed cost plus the profit. So the cost then, talking about waste of resources. I mean, these people are worrying about the contingency on the cost curve. This is the real, <laughs> the real problem. And uh, <clears throat> so this is this is the <laughs> this is the, the problem of cost where the thing where you can do all sorts of stuff. You can, for example, usually in the paper for engineers, <clears throat> full page ads are taken out. We even want engineers in California. So forth. Uh, well, these ads you see are recouped by the government. That was, this, this is a reasonable cost. You can show the press department, and we need advertising for engineers. And just recoup it. So why not? You know, the sky's the limit. Anything which, you, which the suckers in the government can will grant you, you will include as part of your cost. And, uh, and then, of course, there's the cozy interaction. I've talked about antitrust lawyers before, that the, in the Pentagon, for example, retire at full pay, whatever it is, an insane amount even after 20 years' service in general. You then become uh, vice president in charge of procurement, charge of sales, charge of Lockheed or Boeing or something, selling the same planes and missiles to the old buddies in the defense department. And this is a sort of a recirculating thing. Say. And uh, this is what everybody washes everybody <coughs> back for arrangement, except for the taxpayer, the consumer, or whatever else you can work back. <coughs> Any comments on this? Point? Sure. You have a similar analysis for the medical profession. Mm. Yeah. Because, uh, like, I'm involved in, in uh, medical insurance yeah. and other things. Like that. Yeah. It seems to me that it's not for any given procedure, it's cost plus, although to some extent mm. it is. It's just a question of mm. the, the, once you have a <coughs> different set of people paying for mm. things, as they're getting yeah. benefits, then, then you get. Very strange effects. Absolutely. The, uh, there seems to be no limit on the demand as far as the uh, as far as the medical profession is concerned, and uh, whatever they bill is paid, and, and the, the cost to the uh, consumers is very low. Precisely. You just hit it. The you look at the, the inflation record and so forth. You see the last year is five percent or something. Medical costs fifteen percent. Medical is always skyrocketing, much higher than regular inflation rates. Why is that? Well, you have two things going on. Uh, it's not quite the same. It all, it all washes that, as you said, with the third party cost. Um, supply, this is since 1910 in the United States. Supply is severely restricted by the government. It's each state government coordinated by the federal government. So you have the this is the man curve, the supply curve. Supply is pushed way up or to the left. This is the real problem of monopoly. You know, there's all this nonsense about uh, cost curve general motor. This is the push way up because the government steps in and excludes people from being doctors. Very simple operations, licensing, so licensing requirement, especially the requirement of licensing hospitals. <coughs> um, the um, requirement comes in you can only be a doc practicing, practicing physician if, you're, if you were graduated from a certified hospital for certain medical school. And the government, I think what happened is in 1910, this whole thing swept in, uh, 1910 to 14, the government put out of business, the state government of the United States put out of business literally half the hospitals in the country, half the medical schools in the country. It's like that. You're not qualified, you're under, under you're, 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 you're deficient, etc., etc. The AMA helped. AMA, right. Well, the whole thing is put through by AMA in collaboration with government. <coughs> and the state, like New York State, for example, well, turn over, turns over the New York State has a hospital licensing board, where they call it. They staff it with AMA people. They ask the AMA to staff it. The AMA, of course, is very happy to do this. <laughs> and uh, they put on these crazy requirements. And they, they cut the quota. Each medical school have a severe, severe quota. They're only, you know, whatever. They only have 40% of the doctors will apply and admit it and all that, all that sort of stuff. If people want to be a med medical school and admit it. So they cut the number of doctors enormously. They cut the number of hospitals. And... Um, and of course, as you know, time goes on very, very quickly, supplies cut severely to the left and the price goes up. <coughs> and uh, and, the, and when the physicians were pushing for this, they admitted it. They said, this is, 
This is an economic problem, not just a medical problem. You need more, the doctors are not getting a sufficient standard of living. I don't know what sufficient was the need. Sufficient to what they would like to have become accustomed. And so sure enough, uh, the, the number of doctors per person in the United States is now half of what it was in 1910, whatever, and the whole, you know, this, this whole thing follows. And um, <coughs> the, uh, interestingly enough, <coughs> the parts of the medical profession which are the most restrictive, the most monopolistic, in that sense, are those most tied to hospitals. Uh, so that the more hospital-oriented the doctor is, the more monopoly gains he's getting. Uh, surgeons, for example, of course, totally hospital-oriented. They're getting most of the benefit. If you look at the guys who run the American Medical Association, Association they're all surgeons. Why are they all surgeons? The surgeons are better people. I mean, you know, why come they're no internists or dermatologists? Uh, they're all surgeons because the surgeons are the guys who are getting a lion's share of this stuff. But they're hospital. They're totally based on the hospital. And access to the hospital is a key. On the other hand, psychoanalysts would hardly have anything to do with hospitals. They're much less monopolistic. They have much less this kind of supply curve cut to the left, shift to the left. But one of the things that being hospital oriented does, by the way, is that you're allowed to price discriminate. There's nothing wrong with price discrimination necessarily, but surgeons, for example, can do that because there's no competition, very little competition. Price discriminate meaning you find out what the, take, you know, for any given appendix operation, you find out what the income of is, and you sock them uh, accordingly. So the wealthy patient pays much more through the nose, through the appendix than the middle class patient. <laughs> a psychoanalyst doesn't do that because they have a hospital orientation. It may do well, a little bit, but it's peanuts or dentists. I mean, and that is essentially the same price for every, every patient. They haven't got the opportunity to this, for this hospital monopoly. <clears throat> Uh, any rate, so that's uh, that's one one thing. And then, of course, as you said, is the demand curve thing. But, but medical insurance, either governmental or private, third-party insurance, the insurer insurer pays repays any medical cost plus with, except for hundred dollars, whatever it is. They repay anything. Doctor charges. Well, how do you have like an unlimited inside demand curve? It's heaven for the doctor, right? Charge of anything, and the insurance company pays off. What the hell? Patient doesn't care. Got insurance, and so as a result, people are not insured. A few people here and there, the tertiaries of society get the, get, get, the, get, the, get the shaft. Oh, the, the insurance companies can only pay what they take in, so it's everybody's getting the shaft. Yeah, of course, <clears throat> they distribute the costs. In fact, uh, you, you get situations where uh, I remember doctors telling me at two o'clock in the morning on yeah. Saturday night, people come into the outpatient areas of a hospital. Because they're sunburned, he sprays them with Novocaine. He says, "Why didn't you go to the drugstore and get a can of Solarcaine? That's all you needed." Mm -hmm. They say that costs four dollars. This is free. Exactly right. They so have so-called shortage of hospitals come down. That's exactly it's the, same, the same stuff. Um, another thing that happened when, they, when the half the medical schools were put out of business, uh, there was there was a warfare within the medical profession, so-called allopathy in those days, and now called and homeopaths and others. The allopaths, who have now, of course, taken over, or now are medicine, uh, took the opportunity, not, by the way, coincidentally, to, to, sh to totally crush the, the homeopaths. Most of the, of the medical schools were put out of business were homeopath medical schools. And, uh, well, it's sort of interesting. I know it's, not, it's only tangential, but the uh, homeopath I find fairly lovable. I, 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 I'm not going to take side between them. The homeopath is certainly much more lovable. Because. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> They uh, obviously can't hurt anybody. I mean, even the allopaths sort of admit that. In other words, you go to the homeopaths. The only people around are the only homeopaths are either for European immigrants who but still have homeopaths. You know, yeah. People are over the age of eighty. Yeah. yeah. There's an article we have about <coughs> ten of them left in Ontario. And yeah. Um, a bunch of them are retired. Yeah. And, uh, what is a homeopath? Well, extremely low. Basically, they give very very small doses. Of yeah. Things, and they they attempt to. Uh, they tend to give what the body needs, small doses yeah. and only one dose. Teeny, the very teeny. Well, here's the thing. So you go into the homeopath. Homeopath has got millions of different little, little bottles. I know this elderly lady from Austria who's <laughs> one of the homeopaths. Who does it, or has the, the, the little teeny little bottles and teeny little doses, all right? The, and, and the homeopath sits there and talks to you at a great length because you're, the theory is that your personality, on each different personality gets different little herbs for the homeopathic thing. So it means have to, the doctor has to spend a lot of time with you, which is refreshing in itself. Okay. So <laughs> you just say, okay, take three doses of this and you know, come back in two weeks. 
you got to sit and talk to you and say, you know, are you a nervous type or are you optimistic or whatever? And according to your personality type, it gives you the teeny, different teeny nerves. A teeny, a teeny nerves obviously can't hurt. It's pretty clear. And even the allopaths admit that. They just say it's a racket because it doesn't help anybody. Well, a lot of people say they're helped by it. Who am I to say they're not helped by it? Right? And um, also, it's very, almost costless when you get this damn thing. The teeny little bottles, I mean, you know, five bucks worth of a teeny bottle takes five years of treatment. So there's practically no, almost zero cost for the, for the, for the medicine. And pharmacists hate it. And, and more than that, they're cheap because they're natural herbs. You know, to pick them out of the ground or something, they're very cheap. The teeny doses and they're cheap. Uh, and whereas the allopath specializes in synthetic drugs, which are extremely expensive, have to be manufactured by drug companies. Okay? So you have a whole different economic culture involved here. The, the, the allopath, go to an allopath, I mean, for example, I know a friend of mine, I've seen, seen a few years, they have diabetes quite severely, and they got a heavy doses of insulin. <coughs> He went to an old homeopath, as there are only old homeopaths. The guy said, here's the look, he said, here's this little this little bottle, okay, and it's five years worth of doses. Throw away the insulin, because this, this will help, this will cure you. And he threw away the insulin, it's been in great shape ever since. And I'm not saying this will work for every diabetic. I'm saying it costs them next to nothing. And one visit to the homeopath, and five, three dollars for five years worth of stuff. So doctors hate it, drug companies hate it. People invest in drug companies hate it, pharmacists hate it. All right? So these people were put out of were literally put out of business. At the time in nineteen ten and they were considered equally respectable in the Alpine. It was a fierce competition for it. and the the Alpine then turned to the government to put these other guys out of business. Excuse me? Yeah. Am I right assuming the Alapaths are like the doctor? Yeah, they're right what now called positions. Right. Now there's another aspect of this which I'm particularly interested in being an econo being economist and interested in the economic aspect of history, <coughs> so to speak. I mean, who, <laughs> who benefits? I'm always interested in that question. Who benefits by government action, for example? Um, well, obviously, the allopaths benefit. But who else? Okay, you have a situation. The, 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 the report comes in in 1910. There's a Flexner report, okay, which said, uh, written by an extremely beloved figure, Dr. Abraham Flexner, who was not a physician or an, an, an educator. He, he then becomes, he writes this big report on medical education. So, you know, putting out a business in a sense, because his advice was followed by all the state governments, put out a business by, uh, you know, put out a business by all the allopaths and everybody else. So who was he? What, 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 how does he come? He was, a, he, was a principal, he was a headmaster of some high school, okay? and no, no training in medicine, no nothing. Why does he become the guy who writes this big report? Well, because he was, the report was financed by the Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Foundation, especially the Rockefeller Foundation, and the, his brother, Dr. Simon Flexner, who was a doctor, was the head one of the big shots of Rockefeller Foundation. Okay? And we get the pattern begins to emerge for those of us who are pattern oriented. <laughs> or as a friend of mine says, I don't believe in the accidental theory of history. <laughs> I don't believe that life is random. So <laughs> the, the Rockefeller family has always has heavily invested in drug, drug companies, synthetic drug companies. They're very heavily invested in it. All right? The Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research poured an enormous amount of money into drug research. Right? It's not called something else, like Rockefeller Foundation or something. And then, so you have an interesting pattern where the where the where the, the allopaths <coughs> put the homeopaths out of business. The allopaths then specialize in, in Rockefeller drug company products. And uh, so that's, I think that's interesting. It's a pattern of, of uh, you know, whatever business uh, medical cooperation through the government. It's cartelism. It's whatever. It's, I think it works most of the time. That's when we get back to the discussion I had with very little last night about what respons what's responsible for statism. I don't think it's altruism. I think it's this sort of thing we're talking about statism. It's precisely this sort of operation. We use the government to get patronage, to put the other guys, your competitors, out of business, and all that sort of stuff. And that's, that's, that's known now as a government business partnership. <laughs> anyway, so <coughs> that, uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I should give you one more example. I realize it's tangential. It's a beautiful example. I love it. It's from, uh, New York City milk problem. Okay. Uh, the early 1930s, we were in the Big Depression, and uh, those days, most milk was sold by local farmers and local grocery stores, and they were they came in big, in big uh, cans. Can, can, cans, right? Huge cases. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And they were poured out to the consumer. You go to the grocery store, a mom and pop store, wasn't a supermarket. The guy labels it out. You bring the bottle, and give you them, they out the milk. 
There's also uh, Borden and Sheffield, who are the two bottle companies, bottle and milk. Borden and Sheffield cost about twice as much as the other milk, so-called loose milk. Well, Borden, everybody was sort of suffering during the Depression. <clears throat> and the New York City Health Department uh, one day decided, nope, they said loose milk is, is unsafe. Um, we, we, have, we have spoken, it's unsafe. And the former saying, it's not unsafe, Nobody, nobody's been sick, you can't prove it. Well, we'll appoint a commission, committee. It's always a big thing. I don't know what it is here, probably it's not. Appoint a committee, experts. The experts will decide whether loose milk is uns unsafe. They appoint a committee, the committee was seven people. I have at home, I have a little data on them. I'm fascinated by this. Uh, <clears throat> of the committee, one guy was a big shot of the Borden Company, the other guy was a big shot of Sheffield Company. And three others were big shots of the Milbank Fund. Independent truth seeking foundation. When they meet for a few months, they come to the conclusion loose milk is unsafe, it's got to be outlawed post text pronto. And the farmer is saying, no, no, it's ridiculous, you haven't included anything. And they said, look, the only thing you might possibly say is that the, the dipper that they dip in that is not sterile. We've now been working on a sterile dipper. In three months we have a sterile dipper and then you can't say anything. It's a too late, tough, <laughs> loose milk is outlawed. Loose milk was outlawed in New York City, the price immediately doubled. Uh, the supply curve goes <laughs> tremendously to the left, and the price doubles, and poor people can't afford the milk, etc. This is so called New Deal. It's part of the, one of the aspects of the New Deal in the United States. Welfare state, in action. Beginnings of welfare state. So, <clears throat> okay, who's the Milbank Fund? You know about Gordon Sheffield. Milbank, and the New York City Health Department, probably to this day, has a record. The, the, the heads of it and the vice chairman of it are always in and out of the Milbank Fund. In other words, the head of the New York City Health Department is the former vice president of the Milbank Fund. He's there for three years. He goes back to the Milbank Fund as president. That sort of thing. It's constant in and out. So who, who the heck is the Milbank Fund? Well, the Milbank Fund is wholly owned by the Borden Company, by the Borden people. Mr. Borden, Mr. Milbank, who was the owner of the Borden Company. Okay? So it ties it up in a neat little package. <laughs> so, so we have independent, objective, value-free research. Okay? Coming at the inclusion of everybody, all the Borden competitors should be out <laughs> Turn out to be Borden people. Um, I told the story, I was on there was a group, libertarian group about 10 years ago, Mount Sinai Medical School, which is a big shot medical school in New York. They asked me to, to lecture to the class on uh, med medicine and government. So I was talking about all this stuff about licensing. I never got to this little story about New York City, the little bank fund. I was telling the kids, the libertarian kids after I said, Jesus, great story and so forth. I wish I had time to tell it. I said, gee, Professor Walker, we're glad you didn't tell it because everybody on the pay, every every professor in the community medicine department, which is what the course was given, every professor in the community medicine department and outside is on payroll in the Milbank Fund. As of that moment. <laughs> <laughs> so this is just a little window, a you know, microcosm of the way the world works, so it's been <laughs> Okay. Uh, how do we stop it? How do we stop it? Well, that, that's not for discussion. No, that's, that's, a, yeah, that's the next course or whatever. <laughs> it's sort of like the Clifford o, the famous Clifford O'Dets play in the 30s, you know, the comedy play where they, they wind up and the, the, everybody in the audience, everybody on the stage is shouting at the audience, the last final act, strike, strike! <laughs> Everybody's supposed to rush out and strike. We okay. basically have a situation here where yeah. uh, <coughs> illegal chicken production was oh. being planted down on. Oh. And, uh, when I read the article in the paper oh. about these farmers, they, they had, up till now, they'd been able to sell their chickens, oh. mainly to lodges and things like that, that used a large volume throughout yeah. the year. And obviously, pressure was put on the lodges yeah. by government, mm -hmm. and they no longer will accept shipments. And these farmers have no way to get the chickens mm -hmm. to market. And they, they don't have licenses yeah. for growing chickens. Mm -hmm. But I'm so incensed. The thing I wanted to do yeah. was start an Absolutely. illegal chicken buying law. Yeah. 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 You know, I go door to door in a it's, truck it's selling just, illegal chickens. <laughs> illegal chicken. It's just monstrous. Awful. Illegal chickens. It reminds me in Virginia. It's everywhere. Yeah, in Virginia. Yeah. My wife's house in Virginia, so I know something about Virginia. Society. Everybody, they love country ham. Okay, if you know what country ham is, it's very different. But it's very salty and it's flaky and all that. And everybody has got their own little country ham, their favorite country ham. Their Mrs. Window down the road or something. There's little teeny little smoke houses or smoke ham, and they're all slightly different. They all got different wood or whatever it is. And everybody likes their. I like, I like Mrs. Wilson's ham. You know? I like Porter's ham. Sort of. <laughs> so. <laughs> 
What happens is the goddamn government, I think it was the state government, because of the larger meat packers or something, started outlawing these little, they're unsafe, they're, they don't meet OSHA requirements, and started outlawing all these little uh, ham, uh, smoked ham out. That's right, they're not kosher. Pardon? They're not kosher. They're not kosher. <laughs> <laughs> and they're just monstrous. These poor people love this as quarters of ham. You have to, you have to eat armor or whatever it is. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Lubavitch was on them, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Right. <laughs> so, anyway, that's, uh, so that's an enormous amount of stuff like that. So, it's kind of fascinating because this is the way this is the, the real the problem monopoly. They're probably any amount of things. Okay, any more about monopoly? Because I, I want to sh- see, so I guess, what's we'll, the next break before we have to? Uh, yeah, next 15 minutes. Because I want to get to uh, the macro stuff. And uh, so, any more about micro or competition? Yeah. Well, actually, the cost curve. Yeah. The other elements are sometimes presented as a, a cost curve that is continually downsloping throughout the whole range of what's going to be bought by the public. Mm-hmm. Therefore, we we'll only have one firm. Therefore, we want to grant monopoly so that they can get the best um, average cost. Grant monopoly? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, I, I, what can you say? I mean, presumably it would happen that way on the market, but really the most efficient way of doing it. I can't, I can't think of a really natural monopoly. Well, well the, the answer to that is yeah. the of course, and that is that if the economies of scale really do produce lower right. costs, then why do they need a legal monopoly? Exactly. Because they're going to be lower costs anyway. They achieve it on the market, precisely. So it's going to achieve it in yeah. the marketplace, so they don't need to make it a legalized monopoly. Precisely. But, of course, but of course, you're. All these smooth cost curves mm-hmm. are crazy, really, because I mean, yeah. if somebody adds one extra machine to produce one more, then the, co- the cost is going to go up, so you're going to get sort of a U shape yes. there. And then maybe right. a exactly. shape is going to have sure. two horizontal parts to it. Right, have oh, jagged oh, oh, sure. yeah, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, sure, it could be a whole bunch of U jagged or whatever, right. you know, and the cost can start increasing as you go along. Right. Which is, by the way, more, much more realistic than the smooth Kerr arc thing. You have a whole bunch of horizontals, a whole bunch of... You don't know where the heck you are. It's actually what, <laughs> what's going on. <laughs> like, you never know whether you're in a horizontal part or a falling part or whatever. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. Uh, yeah, there's... there's uh, I can't think of any really so-called natural monopoly at all. It used to be, it used to be considered a telephone with a natural monopoly. You have to have one company, because otherwise, because otherwise you have 20 phones and all that sort of stuff. And it turns out, you know, even that was wrong. Even in the old days, before the current technology, that uh, that wasn't really true anyway. And I forget now what the answer was to that. Being twenty, even a hundred years ago, that wasn't really true. And uh, now, of course, what you're getting, I have with additional satellites and uh, microwave and all that. You've got capacity to to, to co- collaborate in, in the same cable, so that you don't have to you have a whole bunch of different phone companies all using the same you know common cable. Yeah, well, you, you know, you know what I, I really found yeah. interesting is that just in the past few years, when they've let private companies sell telephones yeah. in the market, it's incredible how much the technology is improved. Yeah. In fact, it came to the point that I mean, I have a, I have a small telephone that you yeah. know, just lay onto the table; it doesn't have a base <laughs> or anything like that. Or yeah. Basically, uh, it just has a cord that goes to the, to the wall, and and this thing is like. What was it? I think it was like twelve dollars at the very, very most. Belch used to charge like uh, yeah. hundreds of dollars yeah. practically for this kind of equipment. Never and not only that, they're they're coming up with with cordless. I yeah. mean, you know, they, yeah. cordless telephones are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And if you think, you know, if they had let that go yeah. a long time ago, we probably wouldn't have cable shovels. They yeah. would have had transmitters in neighborhoods. Yeah. And you know, I've heard people complain about uh, about well, I mean, then people would be monitoring the the telephone messages. But think. <laughs> about, about, uh, about, let's say, a telephone. They don't really have telephone lines generally from, let's say, London, Ontario to Toronto. They have microwave transmitters. And I know people who have set up equipment so that they can monitor the microwave transmitter. I mean, you know, we were not really, uh, uh, that's, I think, one of the easiest things to, get to convince people I found uh, is, right. is that you're really not protected. By yeah, yeah. It's like the, the mobile telephone. In the city of Toronto, you've got three channels. Mm-hmm. There's two other people in the city that want to talk on their car yeah. phone. Yeah. You don't get on. Yeah. And now they open it up, and the cellular radio is supposed to be here in a year or so. Mm-hmm. Every single person in Toronto could have a mobile phone. Yeah. It still wouldn't crowd the thing out. Yeah. And less money, of course. Yeah, that's great. Mm-hmm. Super. Yeah, the whole data interconnect industry is a feature of that, allowing competition. The other thing about monopolies, though, and particularly in the area of what people consider to be natural mm-hmm. monopolies like that, you wouldn't want to string all those lines, mm-hmm. and if they didn't want to cooperate, they couldn't share the table, is that we're thinking about telephones 
in a conventional sense as opposed to means of communication in a broader sense and means of communication as opposed to food, shelter, or all the other choices in the market. In Austrian economics, is that addressed sufficiently, that there's no such thing as a monopoly for your dollars? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, we're the only ones who stress it because everybody else, again, it goes back to the whole discussion we had about what's a good. The antitrust economists would say, well, you look at the industry. The industry consists of five firms. It's gear shifts or whatever. And it's a terrible thing. The only five firms are producing 80% of the gear shifts. Therefore, they're not allowed to break them up. If you widen the definition of what the thing, what the use is, you have all sorts of different, 2,000 firms. The concentration ratio is much lower. So it all depends on how narrow you make the concentration, you know, the so-called concentration ratio is one of the big things in antitrust people. It's a terrible thing for five firms or the top three firms or whatever to have more than an extra cent of them. I don't know what's arbitrarily arbitrary of those sales. And it's simply, you know, just widen or narrow the definition of what the good is. And make a very narrow good. You can have, I mean, for example, I mean, of course, Wonder Bread is a total monopoly on Wonder Bread. Nobody else can produce Wonder Bread. Anybody else who does it is interfering with the property rights. Okay? So break it up. It's a, Wonder Bread is 100% of the bread market, Wonder Bread market. However, it's <laughs> pretty sad. <laughs> it's a monstrous thing. Then if you stretch it a little bit to white bread, you got a whole bunch of stuff. Then you can stretch it more to rye and pumpernickel and rolls and bagels. <laughs> you know? So the concentration is purely a result of your, your definition of an economist. And they all compete, of course. Like everything competes with the consumer dollar. Well, for example, on vacation, there's a vacation market okay, for people going on vacation. Hotels compete with each other. They also compete with other hotels. They all compete with yacht cruises, you know, Caribbean cruises. They also compete with airline travel to other places. There's a whole bunch Our of things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. A whole bunch of stuff that's competing in that, competing with driving, you know, hotel trips and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, yeah, so the, that's, that's one of the insights. The insights of the Australians. So, uh, I, was, I should say something also about cartels. Uh, something mentioned about uh, cartels, I think, I'm getting together. Uh, the, uh, generally, I think it's a general truth. This, I think, is accepted by other free market people in Austria. Is that cartels don't work on an accepted, accepted government intervention. They cannot, cannot survive uh, on a free market. And for two basic reasons, you have a bunch of people getting together. I'm a, friend of my, a very good friend of mine is a coin dealer. He said, every once in a while, lots of coin dealers, every once in a while, coin dealers get together and say, let's jack up the price. And let's, you know, let's agree and so forth and so on. And he says, somebody, somebody always breaks the agreement. <laughs> somebody goes out there and cuts price by 10% in order to pick up sales or the other suckers and haven't cut the price. And you're back to the race, he says. Constantly happens. And uh, I venture to say there's not a single cartel in the history of the world which existed in the free market for any length of time. It's constantly breaking down. Uh, either because the internal firms um, tremendous pressure now. Like, let's say they have to cut production in order to raise price. They won't agree to that. It's not a difficult thing. They agree, okay, well, we'll cut production by 10%, cut freight shipments, or whatever it happens to be. We'll agree to this, and, uh, and then we'll raise the price by 20%, and we'll be better off. Okay. And so what happens then is everybody sits there and says, if I can secretly cut the price, okay, I can pick up an enormous amount, because it's now 20% higher than the old, old price got placed. Fantastic. They, secret, they start secret price cutting. And one of the interesting things, one of the first things was the Clayton Act, the Antitrust Act outlawed the secret price cutting. In the name of enforcing competition. <laughs> it's never having anything secret. Everything's got to be public. Of course, that means you can't break the cartel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's unfair competition. Yeah, it's unfair competition with secretly price cut. Secret price cutting is a magnificent way by which the market signs the cartel. <laughs> in that equation, though, in, in a free market, yeah. companies could get to, yeah. together and form a cartel, sure. and then the contracts they make should yeah. be upheld by law. But as long as they don't have the ability yeah. to forbid new yeah. entries into the market, sure. someone else will step in, too. Mm. Oh, sure. Yeah, it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of incredible that, that I think it's the Canadian government that's complaining about what is being dumped on the Canadian market. <laughs> I wonder who's really complaining about Bill. a lot is being dumped onto the Canadian market. <laughs> Bill, Bill Davis, no, no, it might be another incident, but Bill Davis is telling people not to buy a lot of these days. And I don't think he's going to buy a lot of it anyway, but never mind. Economic end, someone starts complaining about the Japanese dumping sales. Yeah, I'm not talking about Japanese. All cars. I think, 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 I
that's made up. If the Japanese can make steel cheaper, then we should buy it. Or we can make steel cheaper too. Good. I mean, what is the supernatural? Yeah. They got more, what they got is modern mills and computerized equipment and stuff. They have old steel mills. Yeah, right. That's, that's the problem. I think it'd be a great thing if all the foreign yeah. countries decide that give, give, give us everything for free, you know, undercut our market products, and we got all this stuff free. That'd be great. It'd be magnificent, and nobody have to work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm willing to wait for the, for the short period of time to see what happens. That's another thing. One, 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 I remember back in the 50s when the German, Germany had compulsory cartel. Germany pioneered the welfare state, the warfare state under Bismarck and then everything else. And it pioneered the compulsory cartel. Every, every steel firm was forced to join the steel cartel, etc. For strict production, wage price, have a high tariff to keep them out. So after World War II, the Earhart regime uh, eliminated that and eliminated compulsory cartels. So the argument of the old cartels was this, I get this, they said we need compulsory cartels because we don't have compulsory cartels and one big firm will then take over and out compete everybody, drive everybody to the wall and be monopolistic. Right? So in other words, what they were saying is, let's, see, let's just even assume that happens. Let's say one big steel firm finally emerges after 20 years and they're more efficient. But the, what the cartels are saying is we have to crush uh, efficient, we have to have imposed cartels, but we have to worry about possible future efficient monopolies and impose instead, in order to guard against that, impose inefficient compulsory monopolies right now. That's the argument. Totally insane. I mean, why, I mean, I can see why anybody would fall for that argument? That it just beats, beats me. Well, the biggest example of proof of the efficiency right. of competition is my watch here. You know, I mean, the same as everyone else is watching the room. It's got a computer inside it that's more powerful than the first. Uh, electronic computer produced by IBM back in 1950 or whatever it was, it cost a million dollars. Fantastic. And the chip in yeah. here is, you know, <coughs> cost one yeah. buck. Yeah, I think so. Who's about that? Yeah. The pricing. That's great. It's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, and yet, you get to reduce. Pardon? How much does it cost to reduce? That's the amazing thing. Exactly, yeah. 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 I mean, you know, the amount of competition there is, yeah. I mean, this calculator is for what, 10 bucks now? Less. And the slide rule used to cost that much, yeah, which is yeah. a piece of wood with some marks on it. Right, right, right. <laughs> That's what a slide rule is. Right? You remember the old calculating? You remember the old calculating machine? When I was going to college. They had these massive calculating machines. Uh, Frieden, I think, one, and yeah. Burroughs, whatever. Yeah, Monroe. Yeah, Monroe. Yeah, Monroe. Yeah, you'd, you'd be pounding away in this thing, and then <laughs> only slightly faster than your own you know, pen and pencil. <laughs> You know what you said about the, uh, the early four function calculators costing 400 bucks? Yeah. yeah. And when I first saw one, was I bought one. I bought one. I only paid 100 bucks for one. I figured I was smart and made more price. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I went down and I, I went to Simpsons, which is just about a mile from here. And I bought it in the, uh, this room. And I bought it in this uh, room full of calculators and item machines. And the guy who sold it to me, the salesman, I'll never forget this. He figured out the sales tax on a paper bag. It's mm -hmm. a room full of calculators. Yeah. Which is <laughs> yeah, yeah. The old tried trust in the true way. It's just like that old uh, comic strip that will do it every time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Is this the truth that a Bacchus could beat a computer? And they used to say a Bacchus could beat. Calculator. Right? Calculator. Could you beat a calculator? Really? Yeah, I saw that on some TV show. And it lost the division, but it beat the multiple. Yeah. But that's, that is matching the top operator yeah. in one way to right. the average well, operator right. in another, generally. Right. Right. So I used to do competitions like that really? the old comptometer against electronic calculators. But once people get good at operating, they can meet up. Mary used to, used to work for Victor, by the way, so she's got a nice friend. I heard you say Victor. What's a comptometer? A comptometer is a, a full keyboard <coughs> machine. Well, it's an adding machine. Yeah. With no old. functions in it except adding. Yeah, that's but you But right. you learn to add, subtract, multiply, and divide yeah. by adding. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think it was. Like, really. I, think, oh, it was I mean, the computer operators used to just practically the corner yeah. of the market on, on <laughs> um, doing audits and things like that. Right. Talking about talking about competition, is I was just looking because I can't find it. Anyone remember that cartoon at the back of Wee Cinema? Must have been about a year or so ago about the antitrust people. You know, and in their office they were saying. Well, we've broken up all the all the big companies. What's there to do? <laughs> Go out of business, don't be silly. Go look for some more monopolies. <laughs> and so they look for a market on the corner. They right. see this little sort of grocery right. store on the corner. Say, that's a market on the corner, and that's the corner on the market. It's a market. <laughs> <laughs> so they broke it up. So this Mama's grocery store, Papa's grocery store next door to each other. And the last frame of it. Is, is a couple from a socialist company coming on looking at it and saying, how wasteful do grocery stores <laughs> to each other? Look at the inefficiencies of capitalism. <laughs>
Okay, I think this is the last, the last chunk of, like, of this uh, mammoth seminar. And a lot of people ask me, well, am I going to cover this, that, and the other thing? I think maybe I'm going to try to get the opinion of the people here. What well, topics would you like to have covered? There's also the topics of sort of a macro area. Yeah. Business cycles. Right. Well, inflation. Likely scenarios over the next five to ten years. How do I make a million in the commodity market? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not my I have I got a seminar. <laughs> yeah, it's a different seminar. What was that one? Make a million in the commodities market. Oh, oh. Anybody, uh, anybody else? Uh, somebody asked for a lot, but. Please start with 100 million. <laughs> <laughs> somebody asked for a lot of employment. Can you, uh, can you discuss uh, uh, the uh, printing of money? Yeah, that would be inflation, sure. Yeah, well, I mean, just alternatives to, to that. Possible. I have a new book that just came out, by the way, which of course I strongly recommend, <laughs> called The Mystery of Banking, which is published by Richardson and Snyder, distributed through Dutton. Okay, so that's, you can get it from Dutton. Liberty Library will have it available. Liberty Library, great. <laughs> he was staring me down there. Where, where's your sales? Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, I think it doesn't like the same stuff in here. Unemployment and inflation. Pardon? Unemployment and inflation. The failure of the full unemployment. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. I think uh, one of the interesting things is, is, is the history of business cycle, how this thing starts. Uh, there's an interesting book by Wesley Mitchell, which I don't endorse, but there's some interesting stuff in there called Business Cycle of a Problem in its Setting. It came out in 1927. Uh, and talking about, reported on another investigation by an English economic historian named W.R. Scott. And Scott went back, way back to the 16th century, 15th century, and looked at business annals. In other words, went to all the <clears throat> financial pages and memoirs and whatever, trying to figure out the state of business activity. What was, was, was things depressed or they prosperous or whatever. Essentially, he found something like this. <coughs> there it is. Okay, essentially, he found something like this. Business system, the, the market activity, there were markets that were much more limited than they came later. Okay, so fine then. Or something like that. They go along an even keel, and then something would happen. The king confiscated half the gold in the kingdom, so it's a big depression. <coughs> or there's a war, and so it's a big stimulus, or more cuts off trade, and big depression, something like that. So what you have are <coughs> isolated instances where something happens to the business activity where it's clear to everybody what the cause of was. It's almost always the government. Right? War. Or sometimes a famine or something like that. Mostly the king confiscates, kings often confiscated the money because they didn't have much money, they confiscated it. So there was no business cycle. And it was, things sort of pegged along more or less evenly, and then suddenly something, something happened. But these are exogenous causes, it's called. In other words, outside the market. <clears throat> so these were, these were not anything cyclical, not, not anything that seems to come from within the market. I think scary in the sense of how come this is happening. <clears throat> Then around 1750, to be very, very vague about it, <clears throat> starting really in England and continuing then spreading in the United States later in that uh, late, 19th, late 18th century, early 19th in Western Europe, there began to be curious situations of regular type wave-like fluctuations of business activity, something like this. And. Um, and this is peculiar because there didn't seem to be any specific cause which you can identify and say, okay, this is due to the war, this is due to the king confiscated something, this is due to a famine or a drought. <clears throat> it seemed to come from within the, the business or market system. Uh, <clears throat> and two things happened at the same time. Two mighty, mighty institutional changes. One, the Industrial Revolution, so there's around the mid-18th century, so that 
the market economy spreads and you have industrialization. <clears throat> At the same time, the banking system pops up, fractional reserve banking system. Uh, starting with the Bank of England in 1690 and then spreading to other countries in the mid-18th century. So in other words, the rise of the banking system uh, starts at about the same time as the Industrial Revolution. And ever since then, those economists are trying to investigate the causes of the business cycle. Why is this? Break down in two different broad schools of thought. Those who blame the market economy and or the Industrial Revolution. And those who blame the banking system. Both coincidental. In other words, this is one of the problems of correlation not just co not, does not prove causation. Three things happen at the same time. It could be one or the other or both or neither, whatever. So these are the broad, uh, there's those who blame the industrial market economy, <coughs> those who blame the banks, money, money and banking. Now, within the industrial market economy, there's also the different subdivisions, and, and, uh, et cetera. The, uh, one of the first ones is the famous sunspot theory, which uh, Stanley Jevons, a distinguished economist in micro field, stubbed his tail on the micro field. It was, the theory was that, the, um, that in those days, the theory was a big crisis. People were really worried about the crisis. They weren't worried about the boom, they were worried about the crisis. Why did a sudden collapse? collapse of Credit, perhaps with banks, uh, prices fall, unemployment occurs, bankruptcy, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a theory at one point that every nine and a half years or something, this thing pops up, it's pricey. Therefore, it must be due to some spots.